the army has their tanks the air force has their planes their jets the uh, navy has their boats and then of course the coast guard as well but marines have marines a marine looks back on his student days training to become one of the few and the proud and marvels at what he was able to do with enough people yelling at him there is an inbred fear when you're in a wartime environment so they overreacted and and i don't think there's any doubt about that we pounded a small town that had little or no defense and had shot one bullet at one of our boats and that overreaction is clearly because in the pit of their stomach the gentlemen in charge were concerned about exposing their people to fire and to death and they didn't want to do that and over a half century after the action on the mekong delta a former naval officer recalls his part in a terrifying day in vietnam hello and welcome to the mighty pen podcast i'm david l robbins your host and founder of the Mighty Pen Project, a free writing program for veterans and their families in partnership with the Virginia War Memorial Foundation here in Richmond, Virginia. Our first story comes from Jerry Howard, who as a young cadet in the Marines at Virginia Tech was unsure of what he was capable of until a hurricane came his way and his platoon went out in it to train. And our second story looks back at the fog of war in Vietnam when a single bullet fired from a defenseless village at U.S. coastal boats on the Mekong River brought down an awesome and terrible American wrath. Let's listen first to Hurricane Training, performed by Matt Kreuter. Then I'll talk with author and my fellow Highland Springs High School Springer, Jerry Howard. Justin stood at attention in front of the cadet barracks, focused on the top of Gunny's polished head. The rest of his platoon counted in unison. Anyone, civilian or cadet, was welcome to accompany the Raiders for PT. Gunny used PT sessions as a means for daring students to join his beloved Marine Corps. Those sleeping in civilian dorms near the drill field sometimes complained of the noise. Platoon members frequently shouted, Raiders! as they ran past in unison at 5.25 a.m. Annoying the campus throughout the morning was held in high regard. Hey, Julio! Being late ain't a personal problem. It's a unit problem. Apparently, no one has told Midshipman Harris here how to properly organize and execute a sufficiently effective plan with an alarm clock. So while you get strong, he's going to bamsis his way to punctuality. Midshipman Harris, we patiently await your verbal osmiac. Enjoy the view! Gunnery Sergeant Ramirez's thick Brooklyn accent deepened his bark. Under his shaved pate, his features resembled Mr. Clean minus the earring. Thick-set Hispanic at 5 feet 9, he personified the bulldog marine with attitude to match. His stout Napoleonic demeanor dwarfed anyone who stood near him. Gunnery's wrath began with 204 count flutter kicks, followed by 58 count bodybuilders, 95% humidity and the stifling heat of the Appalachian summer intensified the platoon's misery. Gunny circled them, hands behind his back. Forced to stand and watch while his teammates got strong, Justin lowered his head. All this just to tell him to keep the alarm clock across the room. Midshipman Harris! Midshipman Harris! Have we thought of a plan yet? Hello, Julio! Hello! What are we going to do? What is the plan? Speak up, motherfucker! To put the alarm clock across the room, sir. Sir? Sir? Oh, so you've lost your freaking mind now? I know I didn't just get promoted. My pay sure as hell didn't change. You think I'd be out here if I was a freaking sir? No, Gunny. To put the alarm clock across the room, Gunny. Okay, crazies. Get your asses up. Platoon commander carry out the plan of the day. All right, Gunny. Justin joined the platoon to a cadre of angry glares as they completed the rest of the PT session. The alarm clock beeped. Justin leapt up from the top rack, crossed the room, and smacked the off button. He put on his olive drab PT shirt and camouflage trousers. Lightning flashed. His black combat boots shimmered with a spit shine. Thunder cracked while rain battered the roof. Why am I even doing this? He closed the door quietly. Midshipman Harris reporting. Justin told the platoon guide in the basement room of the Marine Corps and the Naval ROTC offices. 
Wiping his face, he leaned towards another freshman. Is it not crazy out there? Did word come down yet? Are we still doing the boots and the utes, Ron? Word is, 100 people had to be rescued last night. 300 homes were wrecked. Mountains and hurricanes don't mix, apparently. The platoon commander entered. Gunnies, five minutes out. Form up outside. The platoon scrambled through the exit and arranged formation in the wet grass. Gunny paced in front of the platoon. Okay, Julios, you stupid motherfuckers will be pleased to know. Justin exhaled a sigh of relief. The weather was canceling the exercise. Hurricane Fran has been downgraded to a tropical storm, and if it ain't raining, we ain't training. Justin's jaw dropped. Rain peppered his face. Drips from the brim of his cover fell in slow motion. Platoon commander, carry out the motherfucking plan of the day. Aye, Gunny. The platoon commander saluted and faced the platoon. Right first, forward march, double time march. Jogging away from the exterior lights of the offices, the buildings disappeared from view. Behind the walls of blackness, a crescendo of wind, rain, and thundercracks masked their cadence. The swollen mountain creeks overran the roads, treacherous in the low light of zero dark thirty, still an hour before sunrise. Thick clouds and rain held back daybreak. Street lamps along the edge of the drill field provided the only light. They ran on, blinded by rain and wind. Justin strained to focus on the back of the next rat's head. Gusts pushed platoon members out of formation. Stroves of lightning lit the dark field, changing the terrain with each flash. The trees, bushes, and roads appeared as images and vanished into blackness. The platoon left the grass and pavement for a dirt road. A thunder crash made Justin jump. He resisted the urge to plug his ears by tightening his fists. The street lamps disappeared. Campus power failed. Hey, hey, Olio, platoon commander. I know we're not using that bridge. Marines being amphibious in nature. Move through the water, not around it. Aye, Gunny. Guide, you heard him. Aye, sir. The guide led the column of officer candidates toward the rising, rushing water. Justin swallowed hard as they approached the embankment. Gunny insisted the column of students move upstream instead of crossing perpendicular, extending the length of the exercise. We gotta get properly warmed up. Justin hadn't learned a doggy paddle until age 11. He struggled with swimming. His heart rate spiked as he fought the current. Each step in the flashing water brought it closer to his head until the stream covered his chin and mouth. Listen, crazies, I don't care if you have to grab your nuts or your ovaries or whatever. You got to get up Ship Creek, but we will overcome this terrain. The rain fell hard, splashing into his nose. The torrent seemed to deepen. Justin attempted a weak breaststroke, but fell out of the column into a current that shoved against each movement. Trying to regain his footing caused him to submerge. Bouncing off the creek bed, he surfaced, gasping. He ducked under and pushed up again, then inhaled, under, up again, inhale. Justin didn't drown, but lost his sense of direction. Disoriented, he could only move against the current's thrust. The water over his ears muffled his hearing. Gunny's instructions became barely audible. When Marines emerge, we low crawl to keep our fucking heads from getting shot off, so there better not be any clean faces coming up the other side. Low crawling, aye, Gunny. Crawling out of the water, exhaustion kept Justin from raising his head. He ground his face deep into the sludge and wiggled up on his belly up the hill. The run continued. Soaked, Justin's groin chafed. The lightning gave only brief looks at his drenched surroundings. At the campus amphitheater, the lowest two rows of seating were underwater. Tree limbs littered the flooding earth. Looping near the drill field, the platoon halted on submerged gravel. The boys formed one row and began field drills in three inches of water. Count off! They alternated between one and two. Justin paired up with Dogwest, who Gunny called Dog Breath. Attrition is our mission, Gunny howled. If you quit, it's over, misery included. But you stupid fucks want to get my salute one day. You better earn it. You can't be half in and expect to lead, Marines. If you think a hurricane is risky, how about a second lieutenant who still doesn't know what he wants to be when he grows up? That's fucking dangerous. They did wheelbarrow sprints with little upper body strength and large midsection. Dog breath crept ahead on his hands. Next, they crab walked. Dog breath hindered their pace. 
drawing Gunny's ire. Hey, crazies! I know we're not dragging ass, and we're not standing around either. We do continuous push-ups while we wait. And if your chest don't hit water, your push-up isn't low enough. All right, Gunny. Stair crawls and eight-count bodybuilders followed. Mountain climbers, one-legged plank push-ups, three-second squats, and single-clap push-ups mounted into anguish. Every exercise had a debilitating twist and a never-ending series of drills. More low crawling, this time carrying your partner. With dog breath on his back and his head on the ground, Justin's torture continued. His cheek and temple scraped the stones and his chafed groin was afire. His bruised knees and shredded forearms stung in the grit of the mud. After the order to stand, Justin rubbed specks of gravel from his palms. Even through the rain, he tasted the salt of sweat on his lips. Panting and odd and unexpected warmth and calm flowed into his cheeks and jaws. I'm actually still alive. Barely audible over the downpour, Gunny issued their final directive. In combat, you're never going to know who will need to be carried to safety. Dog breath, you're dead. Dog breath fell to the ground. Gunny killed half the other platoon members while the sheet lightning flashed on the bodies littering the wet earth. Those remaining were ordered to firemen carry the dead to an unknown rally point. Gunny headed opposite the drill field. Stocky but nimble, the lightning made him materialize in other locations when he moved. In seconds, he appeared over 50 yards away, returning to the raging creek. Mustering all his strength, Justin hoisted dog breath across his shoulders. Dog breath was the same height as Justin, but weighed 50 pounds more. Justin gained his feet slowly. Out of Gunny's view, dog breath pushed against the small of Justin's back to assist. Dog breath spoke into Justin's ear. I'll do my best to help, but you got this. Justin's legs shook, his back ached, dark rain fell through his eyelashes. Again, he followed the man in front. The creek cheered Justin's every step. His mind raced with his heartbeat. Was he going to drown Dog Breath in himself? Did Gunny not see him barely survive the water the first time across? Near the stream's bank, Justin sank ankle deep in mud. Entering the creek, Dog Breath's weight steadied him against the current. In the approaching dawn, the landscape was becoming at last visible, finite, and conquerable. Gunny led them in circles to a different creek where the water was only waist deep. The rain weakened as Justin thrashed through the water. This time, he didn't just struggle through. Justin attacked the embankment and dug each step hard into the hillside. Every muscle burned with dog breath secured across his shoulders. Justin growled and clawed to the top of the bank. Cresting the hill, the platoon commander appeared in the growing light. He motioned Justin to join the rest of the platoon and form up. Justin stamped past Gunny, who stared nowhere but at him, slowly nodding. Justin roared, Raiders! He set dog breath down and joined the platoon. All the boys echoed his yell. Straightening up, Justin stood tall, chin up and out. He fixed his gaze on nothing and everything. Dog Breath leaned over to whisper, Man, you were born for this shit. I'm joined in the studio by the author of Hurricane Training, Jerry Howard. First of all, Jerry and I went to the same high school. Separated by decades, but still. Springer born, Jerry. Go Springers. <laughs> Springer born, Springer bred. That's right. When I die, <laughs> be Springer dead. <laughs> all right. Now, this story revolves around not just the character you picked that you named Justin Harris. I'll explore that in a minute. But this gunny, mm. this crazy Brooklyn gunny. Now, you are not the first Marine to write a story about a Marine gunny sergeant. It seems to be a very famous or infamous rank in the Marine Corps. What is it about gunnies? Mm. It's a low enough rank that they're still going to be in your face. They're not drowned in paperwork, but it's it's high enough that they've been around. I mean, you might have a, anywhere between 15 and 18-year gunny. Now, that means they've been on two or three deployments. If there's a war, they've been in and out of it a couple of times. So they're not messing around. 
And that's really what it comes down to because their job is to prepare Marines for whatever exercise or uh, operation that the officer commands. Yeah, I've been told that the gunny sergeant is the true repository mm. of the Marine Corps. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite sections in that story is when you describe him as being kind of supernatural. <laughs> that there's a flash oh, yeah. of lightning. Yeah. He's there. There's a, another flash of lightning. And he's over there. You make this gunny a wonderful, almost avatar for combat. Mm. Because combat can appear otherworldly. Absolutely. You know, it can come at you from angles with, that lack logic, that lack reason, that certainly lack the humanity. In the midst of all that, he says, bang, half the platoon is dead, and you get dog breath. Oh, my goodness, yeah. <laughs> you, one of the things I want you to address that I loved about the story is that at no point did you blame dog breath because it seems to me that he's a Marine too. Mm-hmm. You just, I, I kept waiting for you to go, oh, this guy's heavy. Well, and that's indicative of Marines, quite frankly. Uh, it's not always the harder the job, the more excited we're going to be to attack the hill or anything like that. That's not really what it is. It's the ethos of the Marine Corps is win, get the job done. So complaining along the way is not like later on with a beer, we might celebrate and say, dude, <laughs> can we get on that treadmill, you know, or something, right? But, in the moment, we're trying to win. Yeah. Gunny even shouts that at you. He says, we will overcome this mm-hmm. terrain. Mm-hmm. And then perhaps my favorite line of the story is you say that the river cheered every step. Now, the campus was not so happy with you, <laughs> right? Shouting raiders at 530 in the morning. You guys you did that on purpose, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Walk me through that. A hundred percent. We well, part of it was, and this no longer exists at Virginia Tech. So the Virginia Tech Corps of Cadets is still on Upper Quad. Upper Quad used to have the oldest buildings, and one or two of them are still their administrative buildings now. But they used to be the cadet housing barracks. So while they're in their really cushy, relatively new dorm rooms, we're coming from Upper Quad, which is way out there in the middle of kind of nowhere ish, almost like in town. And most of them are, are just going to bed and we're passing their Taj Mahal corporate tower type of environment. So it was important for us to make sure that they didn't get sleep. Because they're not Marines. Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Uh, or they would have been there, right? Or, they would have been exactly. there. Exactly. Yeah. And I ask this question of every Marine that comes in here and sits across from me at a microphone. What is a Marine? Every Marine who's ever come in this studio to talk to me is wearing some Marine paraphernalia. What is it with you? Guys? That's so funny. What's a Marine? <laughs> well, first of all, glad to be a part of the the Semper Fi, bro. The, the club. And <laughs> so I'll, I'll explain it like this, almost like what a Marine is not, right? So the Army has their tanks. The Air Force has their planes, their jets. The uh, Navy has their boats, <laughs> big boats called ships. <laughs> they don't call them boats. That's right. <laughs> They don't like that. Uh, and then, of course, the Coast Guard as well. Um, they have boats. Yeah, they have boats. Yeah, the boat. And I'm absolutely not going to knock Coast Guard because, quite frankly, they take on all the Uzis and the Coke dealers and everybody else. So they get, they're a notch up before I you know, had family and friends that were in the Coast Guard. But Marines have Marines. And when you go to boot camp, boot camp is designed to make a Marine. And a lot of people think they strip you down and slap you together with some other thing. It's not that at all, really. The Marine Corps boot camp experience strips off all the, of course, the physical fat that may be there, but also the, the psychological fat. So whatever they reveal is the raw you, and that gets amplified. So whatever you are, they make that into a better version of that, I would say. Like for me, for example, I would say the Marine Corps, I was a case of unfinished lots of things before I became a Marine. After becoming a Marine, I finished anything I started. In fact, I even got a master's degree while I was in active duty, but it was the focus that the Marine Corps taught me in boot camp that gave me that ability. And that's exactly what the Marine Corps can do for anyone, I believe. The hurricane training is a true story. Yeah. Okay. Why did you tell it through the perspective of a third person, Justin Harris? Why not you? Why not Jerry? <laughs> you know, in the writing process, uh, I was told that it was uh, easier to say I and me 
So I picked the harder route, which is a classic Marine like reaction to a thing. <laughs> it was me that told you. It, that. it was you, David. Absolutely. Uh, I, you know, I didn't get a chance to uh, pat you on the back about that, but that was it. Like it was a harder endeavor. Uh, but as I was writing it, it was actually, I feel like it was easier to uh, bring together the profound truth, as you say, through Justin's eyes than my own. Now, I know you and I know each other well, and I know a great part of your personal narrative is metamorphosis mm. and we detail we both came from the same high school and let's admit that our high school back in the day and maybe even still is a tough part of town absolutely we yeah. both view ourselves as people who have benefited from growing up there mm -hmm. if you can walk me through a little bit of the jerry howard story and put this story this hurricane training in its place in the role that plays in that metamorphosis that's good i would say before joining the Marine Corps, there was consistently inconsistent. You know, I was top of the class, most likely to succeed, uh, and then and then wasn't in the Corps of Cadets or in, in college the first time around. So the Marine Corps created me as a finisher, one who finishes. And when you're smart, you know, when you have relatively high intelligence, regular school isn't that hard. So you don't develop any real discipline, you know, in, in the form in that case in study habits. But also that discipline and study habits also translates to all parts of your life. So when you do learn discipline, like boot camp and the Marine Corps would teach you, and you start applying that outside of just the physical, then it becomes really the catalyst for all, all types of change. And that's really what happened to me was the Marine Corps became the inspiration to, to well, I can finish that. I bet I could finish this. Oh, I bet I could finish this. I bet I could finish and on and on and on. Next thing you know, I got out of the Marine Corps, I had a graduate degree. Two kids in diapers, uh, was married and not being divorced, like 75% of Marines. So it really was almost like the micro version of my life going through boot camp and all the different types of training that we had to do. Mm -hmm. I know that the Mighty Pen has played a, a good role for you because when you and I met, you wouldn't have described yourself as a writer. No. And you do now. Oh, yeah. Take that. I had tried to write previously and really what I know now, of course, it was just me talking on paper, which is a good start. Don't get me wrong. Getting words to flow is definitely a significant portion of the battle. I couldn't give it a percentage, but I definitely know it's hard. But when I started learning from the Mighty Pen Project, what makes a story and then how to put that together in a way that engages the reader. And, you know, it's, it's so funny too, because I think as humans, we live stories. So to learn how to tell a story is almost unique amongst humans. You're not going to find any animal on the planet writing a story. And the other form is that writing in particular, half of the work to enjoy the story is on the part of the reader, mm -hmm. who you may never meet. So as a writer, it's probably, and I think you said this, is the hardest form of art because half of the work is done somewhere else at some other time and space that you'll never know about. And you have to express all that yeah. control in your half. Yeah. Once it gets to the reader's hands, out of your hands. So everything you want them to imagine, envision, intuit, has to be done on your half of the equation. It's just like an architect and a builder. You better make some nice plans, architect, because once the builder gets them, it's out of your hands. Absolutely. Storytelling especially through writing, is, is a very demanding art form for that reason, because your audience does have to work. And most people are not finishers. They will not do that half the work yeah. unless you compel them, right? And it's never good enough. I, I, <laughs> I, I kid you not. And not necessarily in the might of pen, but even to yourself, like as I was listening to the story again, like something came to mind Editing. that would have made it better, right? Yeah. And it's constantly like that. So at some point, you just have to decide, okay, this is what I'm going to give the world. And then that's what you do. The other thing I've learned about writing that I get super excited about is because I don't know how many, what the percentage is, but I heard a, a psychologist say that most people think in pictures. So as writers, I would postulate that we think in words. So in order for us to engage the majority of the population, we have to describe the pictures that they're going to see. And that is incredibly hard as well. So as a Marine that wants to conquer some hill, to me, there's no other harder form of art. Sweet. Yeah. Tell us who you are today. You're a good man, a good friend to me. 
let's hear the success story. I have been published a couple of times now uh, outside of the Mighty Pen in two Christian anthologies. I have one book that is a collection of stories. It's a singular narrative from beginning to end. I've got all of it written. I just need to fine tune some of the uh, more scientific parts of it. But I took right from the Mighty Pen Project the, the skills of writing a story versus just telling. So I'm teaching leadership throughout this book while simultaneously using stories, individual stories, to show the reader what it is that good leadership looks like. And, and it's very similar to what the, uh, the hurricane training does. You have kind of this crescendo of, or this metamorphosis of characters in almost every story where there's something to be learned. And then the other side of it is when you're writing nonfiction, which I have another nonfiction that I'm working on as well, another book that's nonfiction, more in the business realm. But I kid you not, what I took from writing in the Mighty Pen Project the most was how to make a sentence as concise and powerful as possible. So between the last period and the period at the end of your sentence, what are the only words that are necessary to convey what it is you're trying to convey? Only Marines go into a sentence. That's right. Absolutely. You know, like <laughs> we don't need a boat or a plane or a tank. Only Marines. Yeah. We only so have good. each other. We only have each other. That's right. And so I, I, <laughs> I use these techniques in everything that I do. I'm going to have to apologize, by the way, to a lot of my sailors and airmen. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I, once you know what you know, you can't unknow it. Yeah. And that's been a blessing. And I do a lot of speaking too. So I'm an executive mentor. So I do a lot of consulting, speaker and an author, right? The first two I've been doing for a number of years before, but writing has improved everything that I do, Good. particularly with speaking and also even in the consulting. Well, Jerry, I know you and I have no intention of unknowing you. David, it's been a pleasure to be here. And we'll do it again, buddy. You take care. Yes, take sir. Care. Thank you. Temper Fi. Hoorah. And now our second story, The Village, powerfully read by Alan Sater. Afterward, I'll talk with author Hugh Keogh. Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we will pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, in order to assure the survival and the success of liberty. John F. Kennedy Inaugural Address, January 20, 1961. To the 18-year-old first year, an Irish Catholic from West Virginia laboring at Mr. Jefferson's University, these were words of inspiration. JFK was the subject of my consummate, unequivocated admiration. As a Navy ROT midshipman, I began honing my aptitude and my skills to meet this challenge. The seeds were planted. A year and a half later, my apartment mates, all ROTC participants, and I were enthralled with the President's announcement of the Navy's quarantine, better understood as a blockade, to neutralize the Soviet threat in the Cuban Missile Crisis. In his speech, JFK intoned forcefully yet calmly that the greatest danger of all would be to do nothing. We accepted that claim with passion and conviction. As a group, we were ready. So it came to be, after nearly three years on amphibious ships home-ported in Norfolk, Virginia, that I, a lieutenant junior grade, volunteered for Vietnam. My request was granted, and in the spring of 1967, I received orders as executive officer, the number two guy, of the USS Jennings County, operating in the Mekong Delta bordering on the South China Sea. Before deploying to Vietnam, I was sent to San Diego for additional small boat training and to polish my ship handling skills. I was accompanied by my wife of two years and an infant son two months old. When the training was complete, we had a week to drive up the California coast and enjoy time together as a young family. Ultimately, the gut-wrenching day came for me to depart. I put my sobbing Peggy on a plane at the San Francisco airport with a baby in her lap and one in her tummy. Oh, those Irish. And waved goodbye as her plane departed for Washington, D.C. Peg's cared for and loved two infants while her husband was at war 8,000 miles away. 
never ever overlook or take for granted the sacrifices of family members during wartime. Arriving in Saigon from Travis Air Force Base on May 20, 1967, I could not dismiss a certain exhilaration. This place, bustling, noisy, smelly, dirty, but exciting, was exactly where I should be. Let the word go forth from this time and place that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans, born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace, proud of our ancient heritage and unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed at home and around the world. JFK, January 20, 1961. After a day or two of orientation administered by the Army, it was time to join my unit. From the River Patrol boat base at Na Bay, a few miles from Saigon, I was driven down the Cochin River to join the Jennings County. My first taste of the river was deceptive in its serenity. The boat captain, a first-class E-6 gunner's mate named Elmer, was soft-spoken, but knowledgeable and helpful. He would be killed in a firefight two weeks later. But on this day, Elmer introduced me to river patrol boats and the mouths of the Mekong, calmly and politely. The Jennings County was one of four World War II class LSTs reconfigured to serve as a mothership to a squadron of ten river patrol boats. Two Huey gunship helicopters, called Sea Wolves, and periodically a detachment of SEALs for special operations. Our official mission was to interdict Viet Cong activity in the mouths of the Mekong. We would steam to the location of reported VC activity, dispatch the boats and the helos, which in turn would proceed with various approaches to interdiction. The ship was 300 feet long with a crew of 100 sailors and 10 officers. It was equipped with four large booms, two on either side, to which the PBRs could be tied and towed as we navigated the shallow rivers of the Delta. The original tank deck was converted to a maintenance and repair facility for the boats, heavily armed fiberglass units, 22 feet long. The helos were tied down on the flight deck, topside. Importantly, the ship also held 16 barrels of 40-millimeter firepower. They were designed for anti-air warfare, but we leveled them out and fired them horizontally. A 40-millimeter bullet is nearly a foot and a half long. The captain of the J.C. was a lieutenant, a Mustang officer who had come up through the ranks. His demeanor and frequent dismissal of his junior officers kept them on edge, but he knew his stuff operationally. He greeted his new baby-faced exo skeptically, but with a comforting level of acceptance. Operating in a combat environment in the Mekong Delta was taxing, but never dull. We moved the ship several miles every night after dark to prevent the enemy from setting up an attack on a known location. Long hours, scary moments, exhausting days and nights passed quickly and tortuously slow. We were good at what we did, and I never ceased marveling at the selflessness and professionalism of the men with whom I worked. We got the job done whatever it took. These young sailors were the heart and soul of a courageous, effective force, and the folks back home would never appreciate their skill and valor. On a Sunday afternoon in my first month on board, one of our boats on patrol at the southern end of the Cochin took a single gunshot from a tiny village just north of the Free Fire area known as the Rung Sat Special Zone. The boat officer reported being shot at from the village and asked for instructions. The CEO of the PBR squadron huddled with the skipper of the Jennings County, and together they chose to attack the village with all the weaponry at their disposal. Boats, helos, 40 millimeters. The boats began to pummel the shoreline with 50 caliber machine gun fire. The helos dumped rockets and rocket-propelled grenades on the landscape. The Jennings County went on to general quarters and pounded the area with 40 millimeters, directing the guns was my responsibility. There were more than a few gasps at the numbing totality of our action. The village offered no resistance. After 45 minutes, 
Our assault stopped. There was some stirring in the little village, but no response. Wounded staggered toward the shoreline. No celebration ensued from our side. As if to underscore the maddening nature of what we'd done, we sent a medical team ashore to treat those we'd just sought to destroy. When GQ was over, I slunk to my stateroom. What I had participated in was a terrifying and debilitating taste of war. Was this what JFK had in mind? We shall never negotiate out of fear, but we shall never fear to negotiate. JFK, 12061. Through the next 11 months, we prosecuted the war in Vietnam effectively and, frankly, honorably. But I never fully recovered from the sense of guilt from my role in destroying that village. It was a sharp, tangible lesson in the unforgiving and often senseless nature of combat, action, reaction, overreaction. Whether inspired by fear, power, stubbornness, or perversion— the machinery of war causes people to act differently from the people they otherwise, and more truly, are. The Tet Offensive came, and with it a rising intensity of enemy attacks. We held our own. Slowly, inexorably, we learned of the anti-war attitudes swelling back home. I've long believed that throughout Vietnam, Tet wasn't lost on the battlefield. Undeniably, the American people viewed the enemy offensive as a humiliating and exasperating defeat. And the soldiers, sailors, marines, and airmen fighting the battles overseas were to blame, no matter our valor, energy, devotion, and commitment. We were to be disdained and dismissed as villains. In the wake of my terrible experience with the village much earlier, I came close to accepting that mantle. Thank the Lord. I rejected it. Now, the trumpet summons us again, not as a call to arms, though arms we need, not as a call to battle, though embattled we are, but the call to bear the burden of a long twilight struggle, a struggle against the common enemies of man, tyranny, poverty, disease, and war itself. JFK 12061 I'm joined by Hugh Keo, author of The Village. Hugh, the first question that leaps at me is palpable from that story, your admiration for John Kennedy. Clear. Is that still there? It is. Talk to me about John Kennedy. Well, as I say in the book, I was first year in college and uh, very influenceable. He was a master speaker. The inaugural speech was probably, in my judgment, the best speech ever written. Hmm. I've read it several times. But even through the next two and a half, three years before his assassination, he continued to inspire me. And again, as I noted, I was an Irish Catholic, so that gave me an affinity immediately for him that uh, he was the first Catholic president to be elected. But he was very influential, very smart, calming, understood the nature of Vietnam, I think, getting into it, was not baffled by it. And uh, I continued to admire him throughout my college career and on into my later life. He called Vietnam a long twilight struggle. Does that description still fit, do you think, looking back on it? Every bit. The speech was in 1960. People didn't really start going home from Vietnam until the early 70s. Obviously, a long twilight struggle was appropriate. And, you know, we didn't win. It was a very, very frustrating effort. But there was numerous, innumerable examples of courage and leadership by the American military personnel there, and I have the greatest admiration for them. Okay. Real quick, I want to cover your wife, Peg, because in The Mighty Pen, we are careful to always, at every opportunity, express the warrior's gratitude for the people that get left behind. When you were away from your wife and your young, your infant, and then as you say, one in the tummy, I know it was wrenching for you. 
if I had Peg here with me, what would she tell me about this story in your service? I think she would tell you that she understood that sacrifices had to be made and she was willing to make her share of them. We were classmates in high school. We went to different colleges, but remained close through letters and dates and so forth and got married a year after uh, graduation. So we understood each other very thoroughly and very well, and I think she would have taken this to be her share of sacrifice for the American public. That's, that's a beautiful 20th century relationship there. Letters, what a notion. Now we have to get to the pitch of your story, and we'll only talk about this single incident. And I'm, there may have been others, but the one that you catalog in the village was you question whether it was a reaction or an overreaction, this village. And by my count, you had 16 40 millimeter automatic weapons. You had 50 caliber weapons on the gunboats. You had two Hueys complete with rockets. And this barrage lasted for 45 minutes on a village that fired one round. That zero tolerance. I know you look back on that. And I look, you said a very powerful thing in the story that that could have been a rabbit hole. You could have gone down that with grief and regret. I want to start with that first. It's obvious on its face, Hugh, that that was an overreaction. Do you agree now looking back on it? And I'm not trying to force you into a, a compromising answer. I'm not. I respect you immensely and I respect your ideals about this. But your description of it, it's hard to see it any other way. Well. There is an inbred fear when you're in a wartime environment and wartime climate. And I think the commanding officer of the uh, patrol boat squadron and the commanding officer of the ship uh, understood that fear and did not want to risk putting their people in jeopardy. So they overreacted. And, and I don't think there's any doubt about that. Uh, we pounded a small town that had little or no defense and had shot one bullet at one of our boats. I don't know how many we killed. We didn't count them, but we killed several, and we wounded many. And that overreaction is, is clearly because in the pit of their stomach, the gentlemen in charge were concerned about exposing their people to, uh, to fire and to death, and they didn't want to do that. And so they overreacted. That's it. You called it maddening. You said it was a terrifying and debilitating taste of war. And then you say something very compassionate. You say that war creates villains, but the villainous acts are not indicative of who the people truly are. And so that leads me to the second part of this question, who you truly are and were in those moments, even participating in this, as you say, maddening moment of war. You didn't lose yourself into that. You came out of that committed to goodness, committed to conducting yourself in war as an honorable man. But, dude, that's, that's a tough decision because a lot of people will sit in that chair where you are right now and not have been able to come out of that, would have carried that. I've talked to 100 veterans who engaged in similar things. Many have been on this podcast. So the strength of that decision, Hugh, to not carry that burden, I'm fascinated to hear more about that. Well, I think it's important to note, as I say in the story, that we did what we were told. Probably many of us, obviously including myself, had concerns and pitfalls in our stomach about what we were doing, but we did what we were told. And that is emblematic, I think, of the loyalty of the American military. It's not my decision. I wasn't in charge. It was the captain's decision, and he made it. And so we followed up. But it was troublesome, and there's no question about that. It was troublesome at the moment. It was troublesome through later life. It's troublesome today. One of the reactions we could have had was to stop, to stop firing, to stop shooting, and tell the captain to go jump in the lake, no pun intended. We didn't do that. We did what we were told. There were repercussions. They were unfortunate repercussions. I'm not happy about it, but that's the way it is. And I'm, I'm comfortable living with the, the life I have. Good man. Going back to Kennedy for a moment, he said 
never negotiate out of fear, never fear to negotiate. If I had JFK here, and, and he was aware of this episode from your war, what do you think JFK would have said about this event? Well, negotiating with that little village would have been very, very difficult and probably not led to much. But his theory and his goal was certainly pure and, and appropriate. I think he'd have said, you guys overreacted and you should feel bad about it. I often say war is a pestilence and it's best not let out of the bottle. You know, there's very little, very little good comes out of war. In the Mighty Pen here, we focus on moments of it very much like this. And there just aren't that many moments of war that you walk away from going, that was an episode of mankind at its best even in the midst of courage and loyalty and duty, as you say, and it is still war. Yeah. Once it starts, it is awful hard to judge the men and women who, who engage in it because it seems bigger than you, bigger than the moment you're in. I agree with that completely. Yeah. And this moment was bigger than we. Yeah. Hard choice to maintain your humanity and, and frankly, Hugh, your innocence. That must have taken some real faith, faith in yourself, faith in your government, faith in your family. You said that Tet was not lost on the battlefield so much as it was lost at home. That sting a lot when you came home. I know it did. I want to give you a chance to talk about it. Okay. I was on R&R about two months after I left the Tet Offensive, and my wife encouraged me to understand that I was not popular at home and that the Navy wasn't popular at home and that the Vietnam effort was not popular at home. And I had to come to grips with that before I went back to the U.S. a few weeks later. And that's part of growing up, but it's also part of being a military person. You've got to understand that what you do is not always popular. Uh, it can be very dissentious and very difficult, and this was. Peggy and I have now been married 59 years. We're still very much in love, and we still share sentiments, feelings, difficulties, but we share them together and honorably as we should. And her depiction of the American reaction to the Tet Offensive and to the military's efforts in Vietnam was eye-opening to me, but very valuable and a very strong indicator of uh, how she wanted to relate to me. And how was that? With feeling, but with a determination that I understood the pitfalls at home. You related this episode to your wife. What was Peggy's reaction when you told her? Very calm. I think she had, I won't say become used to the fact, but had, had satisfactorily absorbed the notion that I was a, a warrior, but that there could be things that neither of us could control, and that's what happened here. Well, to quote you, you are uh, those Irish. <laughs> well said. Hugh Keogh, as a warrior, and as a man who served on the board here at the Virginia War Memorial to continue to memorialize these stories of character and sacrifice and courage and the finest things that can emerge in mankind out of the unfortunateness of military conflict. As a guy who looks at the military with a certain sort of gloss, even in the midst of having a regrettable or, or so episode. Will you encourage your grandchildren to join the military? It's a different America today. When uh, I volunteered for Navy ROTC, the draft was very much in effect. And when the draft ended, America changed. Young men didn't have to go, and so they didn't go. It's a very different situation than it was 50 years ago. And so... I can't say that I encourage my grandchildren to join. I'd be delighted if they did. I'd be pleased if they did. I share with them some of my experiences, and proudly so. But I don't encourage them. I think they have to come to that understanding on their own. If one comes to you and says, Grandpa, what do you think? What do you say? I say, do it. There we go. I was the one I was looking for. Hugh, thank you for coming in, man. My pleasure. Great it's to be with you, Dave. To see you. Great to be with you.
Mighty Pen Project is a free writing program for military veterans and their families. Offered by the Virginia War Memorial Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit. If you'd like to learn more about the Mighty Pen or just send us your thoughts, email us at mppodcast at vawarmemorial.org or use the link in the podcast description. If you're a veteran or a family member of a serviceman or woman listening to this podcast anywhere in America and you want to learn how to best tell your own powerful stories, you can sign up for one of our Mighty Pen writing workshops on Zoom. If you want to read today's pieces and many more, use the link to go to the Mighty Pen archive. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it. Music for this episode was provided by Jackson Albrecht. Lastly, if you'd like to support the Mighty Pen's efforts to record and preserve these stories of service, adventure, and sacrifice, follow the charitable donation link in the podcast description. I'm David L. Robbins, and I want to thank you for listening to the Mighty Pen Podcast. It's an honor.